Fans Beyond Wrestling, this is Denver, Colorado, the man, not the place. Thanks for joining us for today's edition of Positive Contact with Tony Deppen. And as always, Positive Contact brought to you by Independent Wrestling TV. So head over to IWTV.live, sign up using promo code BEYOND. Uh, you'll get a five-day free trial. And if you can afford to do so, please stay on as a paid subscriber. Uh, it's where you're going to be able to see Tony Deppen's run from Uncharted Territory, all of his other matches that he's had for Beyond Wrestling and countless other promotions. Uh, Tony Deppen, it's a strange, weird world out there. What's the best way that fans can support you right now? Oh, I do have my Pro Wrestling Tees uh, website, which obviously just search Tony Deppen. I have like six or seven designs on there right now, so any little bit helps. I, this month I did very well with there, thankfully. Um, uh, my Instagram, you want to follow me there because I'll be doing a live uh, – feed with leo rush in the next week so i believe that's going to be on instagram so you can check that out it's under insta deppin and then my twitter tony underscore deppin don't add me on facebook because i'm not going to add you i it's a personal thing so i feel privileged that we get to be friends uh friends on facebook then that means that we're actual friends and not just colleagues well we know we've known each other for 15 years so has it, has it really been that long yeah well i think i'm officially met you in person 2007 oh my but God. through the link you know knowing of you watching videos i'd say 2005 let's just jump into the backyard wrestling then uh what, what was the name of the, the local promotion that you used to wrestle for uh we were uh xtw extreme trampoline wrestling because we we wrestled on trampoline but it wasn't like a normal trampoline we built up a, a base on it pretty much we took a bunch of pallets made it up about probably about to knee high of where the trampoline would be. And then after that, put a bunch of mattresses underneath it. So you'd still get a little spring, but it'd be a really soft bump. And then we made a big rampway. And then we had a insulation from RVs that the one guy took and we built like a top rope out of it, basically just stacked them as high as you possibly can. That's what we use as a top rope. All right. I mean, my, my memory, you know, I, I'm kind of foggy, but I remember kind of meeting you along, uh, around the same time that I met Arbo and Bruce Maxwell. And then Arbo, uh, that backyard wrestling uh, entity had like a very small, like maybe a 12 foot by 12 foot ring. Uh, but Bruce Maxwell had the full setup. Uh, were you involved with those guys or was it only through the like the link super shows? Like through Maxwell? Either through Maxwell or Arbo, because those are even two separate things, right? So, like, Ar Arbo was with XTW. Okay. We had the uh, twelve. We got we had the, the the base built up, and Arbo and them were using that for probably about a year or two, and then uh, this one comp local company they got they're getting rid of their training ring, which was our twelve by twelve that we we got. They're like, do you want it for free? We're like, yeah, sure, no problem. And then Maxwell's, that was SBW, which was out in the Sealands Grove area, which is about an hour from my house. So we went every, they would do shows once a, one Saturday a month. And we'd go out there with all, all the XTW guys would go out there and all their guys would come to XTW every week. So it's kind of like an inner, how LWF was and stuff, like where they're just like intertwined with everyone. So the best way that everybody kept in contact, was that through the backyard wrestling link or did you guys know each other from something separate than that? Uh, I don't know exactly how everybody met originally because Arbo and them were, have been doing it for many years prior to me coming in. So I don't know where they met, but we used to, we all had AOL. So that's how we keep uh, in contact with each other. And then we had our own XTW message board, which was on our site that had the links to all of our uh, music videos and such like that. So that's the, that's our best way we kept in contact with them. It was like, it was prior to me ever being on the link. So like, but as soon as I discovered the link, I wasn't really using the XCW message board as much. It's funny because the message boards were such an integral part of communication really before social media, or as they called it at the time, web 2.0, uh, became somewhat, uh, ubiquitous. Um, and I actually remember going back, like when I was in college and I kind of had plans as far as what, what eventually became beyond wrestling. And part of that was being able to go on a message board that the wrestlers would post on, obviously inspired by the backyard wrestling link. And for the fans to be able to interact with, uh, you know, have threads that they can conduct interviews and stuff like that. And it's just wild. Cause nowadays with social media, um, you know, that's basically how it is. Whereas before 
you know, there were restrictions if you wanted to talk directly to the wrestlers. You wouldn't be able to send a tweet to The Rock, you know what I mean? Um, I have no idea even what the process of doing fan mail back in the day would have been, but the message boards were like an extremely solid resource for all of us to kind of keep together. And then, you know, my experience, at least when we were doing XRW, uh, Extreme Rhode Island Wrestling, which should have been E-R-I-W, uh, but I didn't come up with it, was as people got older and less were available, we turned to the link. Um, and then even though we weren't doing it regularly or on our own, we were making the trips, meeting other people. And it was kind of done under the guise of a super show. Uh, did you have a similar experience or did everybody that you were wrestling with just like stay on board the whole time? We stayed on board, like, everybody. Because, like, I remember – this is again, this is going to be against you, Drew. Uh, like, one of the first times on any Super Show that uh, Arbo and Andy were going to, because Andy started to intertwine himself into XTW like, at a, on a weekly basis because all those guys stopped wrestling pretty much. But um, they were going up there, and they – apparently Arbo and them asked about, like, me coming up and wrestling, and they're like, no, nah, he's not good enough or something like that on those lines, which I, at the time, how you were, I can guarantee that's probably pretty accurate. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I used to be uh, like a complete fucking psychopath when it came to organizing uh, all of those shows. And I'm really glad that I got out of my system before. Like I really tried to pursue stuff on a serious professional level because uh, if people think that I'm tough to deal with now, they should have like had to interact with me 10 or 15 years ago when it, it really there wasn't much online except for, for having fun. Uh, and I would, uh, I guess come in the way of that frequently. Um, yeah. the first big, uh, kind of endeavor I remember is when we, you know, tried to put together backyard week, uh, which is when there was the backyard gathering was the show that was hosted in Pennsylvania. Um, BYE were the, the branding of the, of the super shows that we would have up in new England. And then obviously backyard fest was kind of the big one, um, that was kind of exclusive. I was asking Dave Cole how he got involved in Backyard Fest 5, and he, he couldn't even remember, but some somebody must have thought he was pretty good in order to get that invite out to Ohio. Um, but that Backyard Gathering show, do you have any, do you have any memories of that? Was it, was it exciting? Was it stupid because you had to deal with idiots from the Northeast? <laughs> well, the first experience I really had with any of the Link guys, uh, like on a – more uh personal basis was probably BYE 777 that was the first time so it what was like, that that was that was the show that was supposed to happen that ended up getting canceled right no it was in Shimokin it was at the because uh, it had a uh, Andy versus that guy from was he from Newfoundland oh um and it had Jonah versus some guy named Dan yeah you know what, dude? I wish there was a cagematch.net for fucking all of our back here stuff because I, I Jack versus uh uh what the J Bird, whatever his name was his wrestling name. Fantastic Max, yeah. Okay. Like you cause you started the you started the show with a promo. That was the first time. Like I had the I had the I had a match with my brother that night. Was it outside? Yeah. Okay. You wrestled your brother and then is that the the same show that Suicide wrestled Raw Sewage? No, that was BYG. I wrestled my brother at both of them. Oh, okay. So, so you could see how I would get confused. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, think, I forget what, why I had wrestled. I don't, actually, I don't even think my brother and I were supposed to wrestle at BYG because it was invite only. Like, people don't understand these backyard shows were invite only. It wasn't just like, hey, I'm here. You used to, you used to have to pay dues to get on. For backyard yeah. week, everybody had to kick in 50 bucks. And, uh, you know, it, that went towards building sets. I mean, the, the BYG set had, uh, it was like a Fago fountain now. <laughs> Like legitimate running, uh, you know, liquids. The 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 backyard fest ten set had a big, had a big uh, a big penis uh, that was supposed to piss, but it, it didn't end up doing that. Um, I'm embarrassed now, but anyway, um, okay. It's, who were some people from the link that you liked? Not uh, me. I not see no it's like because you had a very uh, abrasive personality, and I think it, it's. It, I didn't mind it. Like, I, I thought you were a dick at first because of the fact that you were like that. But then I was like, I'd probably be the same way. You know, I, I wouldn't want shit shows, you know, at, on mine. So I didn't, I didn't hate you, but I didn't like you. It was just like, okay, it's true. Like, that's the way I looked at it. I really liked Ricky when I first met. I still like Ricky today, but like Ricky, uh, after my match, because it was me and my brother versus him and Scott. And he's just like, after he took me aside, he's like, you need to get out of the yard and start pursuing this like on the indie level. I was like, Oh, okay, cool. I think I appreciate that. Cause everybody, 
used to talk how, you know, Ricky was the big deal in the yard, you know, he was the one actually doing stuff in the Indies. So I liked Ricky a lot. I don't even, I liked Ace Jacks and all those guys. I liked most of the guys, like nobody ever, no one, I didn't like uh, Mike Quest. I'll gladly say, I don't care. I didn't like him at all. I think he's an asshole for no fucking reason. Um, I didn't really like, um, I had it in my mind. Who didn't I like? No, I didn't like Mike Quest. A lot of the Jersey guys rubbed me the wrong way. I could definitely see that. There was some pretty weird guys coming from Jersey. Chris Maverick. Um, definitely weird guy. I, I, but those guys also um, really were like wicked passionate about it. And I, I think with the Jersey guys too, they had the benefit of obviously somebody like Quest being trained, then being in the UWA elite. Um, and then like having like Jay Lethal wrestle with those guys from time to time, like even while he was the ring of honor pure champion. So even if they weren't necessarily trained themselves by virtue of working with people that were properly trained, um, it seemed like they kind of had a leg up. And so I don't know if they just had a chip on their shoulder, if they're just fucking weirdos because they're from New Jersey, but I, but I definitely get that. Um, while we're talking about proximity and, uh, and locations, what's the farthest that you ever traveled to do a backyard show? Florida. All right, I drove down to Florida in 2000. Eight or nine? Would that have been something affiliated with the Chad? Yeah, like one of those backyard Christmas shows or whatever it was, I think whatever like that. It was me, Kale, uh, Corvus, Freak Boy, a couple other people. That's when Freak Boy broke his face. Great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, but I, I don't know that people, you know, kind of realize the the modern independent wrestling scene and how much of it, uh, you know, when when we first started. Um, it was taboo because, you know, if you were a backyard wrestler, um, then, you know, there was no place for you in professional wrestling. But what always intrigued me was there were so many people that had professional training like Corvus, like Ricky, even like Quest. Um, and they still preferred to do backyard wrestling. Um, and that was kind of always why I wanted to move forward with beyond wrestling. Um, but the, the real big final undertaking uh for me was that backyard week and it was you know doing the five shows over the course of eight days the three states um and it was just got to the point like, again with people contributing and paying dues where it's like we are on to something bigger and it's funny that ricky would say to you hey you should get out of the backyard you should get trained when he was trained and preferred doing backyard wrestling um but uh what was the f what, what what actually I, I i definitely want to talk about backyard week because we can't we can't you just gotta tell the fucking lobster story you just gotta do it like let's just get out of the way okay so well we should, do you want to set the pace on like the, the no no you're it's all you it's all you you do it set the pace tell the whole story okay, okay. I'm, I'm still mortified all these years later so there uh drew decided to book a fans bring the weapons match against two of our local guys they're brothers uh suicide and raw sewage so like Fans bring the weapons and all the wrestlers, we went to Walmart that morning. Cause I lived there. A lot of them were staying at my house. When we went to a, a, the local Walmart and we were just looking at the most ridiculous things that any, anybody can get. I don't remember who it was. Maybe, maybe Ace Jax, maybe Jonah. I really wish I could remember. Somebody from New Jersey. Absolutely. One of those one scumbags. Of the, one of the Jersey guys are like, Hey, let's buy a lobster. Maybe they'll use it. So they did whatever. And, uh, if you, if anybody actually knows Joe and Kev like I do, they're, they're the most fucked up guys in the world. Like they have like the highest tolerance for pain. If they would have jumped in the deathmatch world or something like that, they'd be in Japan doing that stuff for a living easily because they're lunatics. So the spot comes for the lobster, and Suicide wraps the lobster around his arm, like tapes it, and then throws one of the stiffest clotheslines he possibly could do to his brother right in the face and the lobster exploded completely dead i'm pretty sure pete is going to come after us for talking about this yeah i was just thinking this is like when people always complain about uh some of the stories that elgin told on the kevin steen like we're not sitting here like laughing about it loving it i hated it at the time i thought that that was like just completely unnecessary i'm sure that you share the same opinion but it's just one of those things it's like till the day that i die i will never forget like just even like, no, they're just, they're pretending they're going to do it. And the, the, the spectacle of it, again, like seeing a fucking live animal blow up in the context of a wrestling match. That probably wasn't even the worst thing either. Cause somebody took an oar that you would use with a canoe. And then they took 
um, golf tees, wooden golf tees, and they spelled out the word fuck on the, on the paddle of the oar. And that got hit. And I remember one of them, it looked like it broke off, but it didn't even break off. It punctured the space between the scalp and the skull and slid like almost an inch underneath. And I just, oh my God, those guys were cooked. Those guys were out of control. They um, think that uh, everybody thinks that the skewers are bad. That fuck or was the worst thing in the world. And the fact is what they did, I don't, the finish was uh, premature because uh, Ross Sewage got hurt. His arm, right? His shoulder, maybe? Up his shoulder up, yeah. In the original finishes, they were going to, you know those, the mats that are under, or that are at desks, like if they're on a carpet desk, or a carpeted uh, office, like you have those plastic. Uh, and, and they kind of, they kind of sink into the carpet. Yeah, so that way your, your chair can go over it, your rolly chair, those, right? Like, real, real thick dagger things on them. They're going to wrap them in that, like put them on a table, and then jump out of a tree onto them. That was supposed to be the finish. <laughs> so I remember when I met one of those guys uh, where Andy lived at the time, Anarchy Andy or uh, Unbreakable Andy, there was like a steep hill. And one of them, I can't even remember at the time if it was suicide or Russell, it was just fucking did like a, like a flip them down, down like a concrete hill. Those guys were cooked. It was um, definitely suicide. It was definitely suicide. Yeah. Um, when, when did you kind of transition from doing backyard wrestling? When did you start training? Uh, did you, did you always have aspirations of being a professional wrestler? Or did you just like hanging out with your friends? Like what, what was it that, that, you know, made you want to do it? I always wanted to do one indie show. Like, to be honest, like when I even got into backyard wrestling, I was on the verge of not liking wrestling anymore. Cause I was like, I didn't, I knew a little bit of the indie scene. Like I knew of like the tournament of deaths. Cause that's my one friend would show me, but actually like indie or back do, wrestling in the backyard actually saved me from stopping wrestling like i hated it but then that reignited my passion so like 2008 andy and arbo started like getting some some steam going because like they had like a bunch of crazy matches everywhere and then uh suicide uh he his mother passed away so he got heavily into drinking and stuff like really bad in drinking so he wasn't really wrestling anymore and neither was raw sewage. Like they just like everybody started to slowly not wrestle as much. And I was just like, well, I still want to wrestle. And the only way possible to do that was to jump on the indie scene. So where Andy and Arbo were wrestling on a frequent basis, they had a, a, a training school. I'm going to use that very loosely because it was bump buck Pennsylvania. It wasn't much of a uh, training school to be honest, but I went up there and I started learning from Andy and Arbo. And thankfully when, you know, being in the yard so much like when we first started Andy and Arbo and them were they were slightly trained when I first went up so they're like hey uh if you want to wrestle with us you have to come up and train with us for a few days a week before you even wrestle because we don't want you hurting us or yourself so s jumping into like the indie scene like I had a little bit of idea of the training so like I picked up quicker I guess than some of the other people I was wrestling with because to be honest none of those people are wrestling anyways anymore but it wasn't much of a training school. I, a lot of my stuff came through just doing seminars and watching stuff on repeat. And that was around like 2009 when I first started. So, I mean, a lot of people think that you're very young. Obviously, you still look young, and that's that's a good thing. Um, but kind of new to exploding onto the national independent wrestling scene within maybe the last three or four years. But, I, I mean, I guess – you know, I, I know you since we go back 15 years, but that might come as a surprise to a lot of people that you're more than a 10-year veteran of professional wrestling. Did you spend a lot of time just with the local kind of Pennsylvania promotions, just doing it because you enjoyed it and not so much trying to pursue anything larger? Uh, I never I never thought, because, like, look at my size. I'm not, like, it doesn't matter how much weight I put on. I'm never going to be a big person. Like, it's just, that's the way I was born. So like, I always just like had no aspirations to make a living. Cause I didn't think it was possible. Like I was like, Oh, it'd be really cool if I did like Shakar or CZW. Like those are my biggest goals. Like, Oh, if I do them, you know, I felt like I was successful and I was just doing a lot of Pennsylvania shows. And I was just getting, after I graduated college in 2015, I was just getting ready just to be like, you know what? I'm not doing anything. Chance of me ever getting to like a CZW or Shakara, not going to happen. So like, I was going to quit. And then my wife's like, Hey, I enjoy watching you wrestle. Can you at least continue to wrestle for just one more year? Please get one more year. I was like, okay. And that was when I met Tremont and uh, Loudy at on point wrestling. Cause I was at, a, I was at a, 
oddly enough, I was at a GC, I was at the first ever NGI for GCW to watch. And that's where I met Loudy and Matt. My friend was drunk as shit. And he's like, hey, Loudy, this guy wrestles. And Loudy's like, oh, well, send me your information. And so I did. And then the next thing I knew, I was on their one tournament. And just that's where I met Janella. And I remember recently, not too much longer after that, Joey was on a podcast and they said something about me. And they're like, where, where has he been? And Joey's like, in the fucking bum, the bum fucks of Pennsylvania. So like, and then, and Joey's always put a word out for me. Like that was one reason why I was going to deb- debut and beyond for please come back because Joey suggested me to wrestle him. And then that's how I got into Canada. That's how I got a PWG. So like, thanks to Joey, like my ball got rolling pretty, pretty heavily as soon as I met him. I definitely remember kind of uh, when you came to prominence at on point wrestling uh, before we get to that though. Uh, I just want to ask you, cause I have a weird personal experience there, but was there ever a church in Pennsylvania that was converted into a wrestling arena uh, that I feel like I went and did one show at. Um, but the thing that blew my mind is that across the street, there was a bar and they still sold 25 cent yinglings. That was PCWA. That's where I trained in the church. Oh, Dude, cool. they, used to, they would run some shows and they would pack that thing to the T. They'd be like four or 500 people there some nights. But that was when they had a big name on it, and then the guy that brought the name in had to wrestle him. <laughs> so, as it always saw, goes, right? I saw Billy Gunn punch the the guy in the nose or straight in the nose for doing that. Like Billy Gunn wrestled the the guy that paid for him to come in, and Billy did a seminar. And Billy's like, "Hey, don't do this one thing." I I wish I could remember what it was, but anyways, the guy that you know the the money mark. Well, he did exactly what Billy said not to do. So, match sucked. Billy walks in the back, tells everybody, like, get the fuck out right now. And tells all the wrestlers to. Billy starts just blasting in this guy, blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden, the guy runs out with a bloody nose. Nobody knows what happened because nobody was in there, but Billy socked him one. The first time I ever met Billy Gunn in person, it was, uh, it was me, Ricky, Vince, nothing, and uh, M-Dog. We drove out to a show in St. Cloud, Minnesota. Um, when Billy Gunn passed us, I could not be- – it was like a statue coming at us. That guy's enormous. I would absolutely not want to get punched by Billy Gunn. Um, I think we also had the hotel room next to him, and so we decided that we really wanted to play uh, the Mr. Ass theme, like, really loud to see if, like, he would, like, come knock on the door. Because um, you got to think at some point, like, maybe he's sick of hearing it, but maybe not because it's kind of awesome. So, uh, needless to say, uh, none of us got punched in the nose. So, I'm very thankful of that. Um, from that period of time before you kind of made your debut with on point wrestling, are there any matches that come to mind that you're particularly proud of that people might be able to look up on YouTube or maybe even better yet on our sponsor's website, IWTV? A lot of my matches with Andy, like, I, I don't know what it is with Andy and I, but we had, like, we both pull something really good out of each other and stuff like that. Not everybody can, like, I don't always get that. It's the chemistry we have, but I don't, I never get that feeling with anybody else when I'm saying like I'm not afraid to throw like certain things out to be like let's do this or let's let's modify this and and Andy will be the first one to tell you he has the personality of a wet bag so and I can't be I'm not as athletic as Andy so it's like re, like we just compliment each other on such a great base I don't know what it is but like they're on YouTube they're also on um IWTV for on point wrestling matches like we we did one at Masters of Matt then we did God, I can't. There's a show right after that. I like we we did like three shows in a row, and it, it, it culminated to a ladder match for the number one contendership to go for the title against Janela. So a and lot I of think, those matches will be. The, you'll see some really cool stuff in it. Like we've always just done the most wacky wackiest things you could possibly think of. I, I always think of uh, around the time that Andy and Arbo kind of got a foot in the door um, with CZW, and they had a three way, and I think. AR Fox was in the match. Yep. And I just remember being like, who is this guy? Like, don't put this guy in the match. Like, just let Andy and Arbo do their thing. Like, the match is going to be brought down because of AR Fox's involvement. Needless to say, AR Fox, uh, in, in terms of what he's accomplished in his career, certainly surpassed both of them. Um, what's happened to Andy and Arbo? Are either of them still active or? Uh, well, Arbo has four kids and just like he real busy with that like i i know we're all gonna get together and wrestle in the yard one day soon because we were just all talking about it. i don't care if somebody wants to blackball me for i couldn't give two shits you're not gonna blackball me andy uh he broke his face like he broke his orbital bone wrestling yeah 
And this was like two weeks before spring break last year because he was supposed to be in a multi-man at spring break. Uh, so, and the kind of like, I, everybody's like, oh, he's done, he's done. But I'm pretty sure he's making a little comeback, um, which I hope he does because uh, he has so much talent. And if you don't know who Andy is, like, he's just a very talented, super creative person. His thing is he just belong and he never got paid and he still feels that's the way the Indies are still at it currently and I tried to tell him I was like yo you can make money you could you know you could get so much exposure you could do so much he's like I don't believe you. I don't believe you and I hope he I hope this next little run like if he does one more run I'm forcing to wrestle me at GCW like if I if some crazy thing happens that I get signed somewhere where I'm I can't wrestle in the Indies more I want him to be my last indie match and I'm gonna force him to come out of retirement if he doesn't I'm gonna beat the shit on him if he doesn't I want that to be my last match because he's like I said, the, the, I want to go – the way I went in wrestling of getting exposure is through him. Last way I'm going out, I want to go through him, and I want him to get the exposure that he deserves. Like, even if he gets like a solid year run where he's getting flown all over the place making some money, I'd be happy. He yeah, it. I mean, I, I could definitely see that. I mean, Andy was definitely always somebody that was welcome when Beyond first started and just for one reason or another – because I think he did hybrid a little bit at the time. Um, but for one reason or another, it never worked out where he was able to do it. And, I mean, it wasn't an unwillingness to travel necessarily because I think that the last uh, BYE that we did before it became uh, Beyond Wrestling uh, was up in New England, and, and he was there for that too. So, no, Andy's definitely somebody that, uh, that I hope gets a, gets a fair shake on a big stage. But going back to the ladder match that you had at On Point Wrestling, that was – I remember the first time that I kind of put two and two together and realized, like, oh, Tony Deppin is, like, on the scene, um, you know, coming up. Uh, and I just remember the feedback on that match where maybe somebody put together either a series of clips um, – or a music video, and it was just like, Jesus Christ, even for an independent wrestling match, this seems like a lot. That's kind of what made it awesome, though. Uh, what are your thoughts on that match? I love that match. Like, uh, we, and the music video doesn't do justice because I actually, like, I, I, everyone says it's too much, but we, one, we were the main event, so we weren't taken away from anyone at all. And people knew that we kind of go really far out there with what we do. So, like, okay, let's make this out there. But we also, I also worked his leg and like, you know, there's some psychology and you know, like just the way like things were moved. And I, I loved every second of it. Like it wasn't just all, oh, everybody bumps on ladders. It was extremely creative things that we just thought of. Like, Cause he would drive down the show with me and we would just say like, yo, what if we did something stupid like this, 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 and, and everybody loved it. Like I, I still love it to this day. Like I, I watch a lot of my matches back a lot and I pick apart everything. I'm just like, yo, I just love, I still love that match. Just, watch the music video and then go watch the entire match on IWTV. I think it's the rise to the occasion. The only reason I remember that is because, you know, you climb the ladder, you rise to an occasion. That's the only reason I remember that title and show, but go watch that match. Watch the entire show because on point always put out really good product in like 2016. Yeah, and I think that On Point is one of the most complete catalogs on IWTV, too. So, again, anybody that's watching and listening, head over to IWTV.live. If you want to sign up using promo code BEYOND and stand as a paid subscriber, I'm not going to say no because that's what's keeping us in business while uh, there's not any live wrestling going on. Um, you said it was through On Point Wrestling uh, that you had um, – excuse me – that you were able to connect with Joey Janela, who was going to bat for you. When was the first time that you wrestled Joey? After Rise for Occasion, that's sh- no, no, we wrestled at uh, Dojo Wars in like I want to say maybe March of March of sixteen. So that would that would have been before or after the ladder match. Right after that, because I remember that I was having my match. I was like, oh man, like because he beat the dog shit out of me in that match. Like I. Not, it, and Joey was trying to find himself at the time, so Joey was just doing things that, like, weren't really, like, the best, you know, for people's safety sometimes. Like, and I got a concussion from that match. That was the first time I ever received a concussion. So, like, I was just like, man, it's like, I don't want to have to deal with this shit again. But then that match, like, it was funny because when Joey and I came, when Joey came, he's like, oh, I, I had a rough match the night prior. He's like, you want to take it easy on the strikes? Because, like, he was hitting me. I was like, okay, I'm just going to hit you as hard as I possibly can. But then when he said that, going into the match, I was like, okay, good. So we do something, something, and Joey comes in and lays his forearm into me. I go, what the fuck, dude? And he's like, I'm so sorry. Let's not do that again. I was like, okay, cool. And then the rest of the match was just soft. And just we, we worked our strikes, which I was happy. 
And so obviously that also pl- probably played a part as far as Joey, you know, going to bat for you. Um, you said that you were able to get into Canada. What are some of the spots in Canada that you wrestled at? I've only, well, I just re- recently wrestled in Vancouver in January, but other than that, I only ever do C4. Cause Julian asked me to do uh, alpha one a couple of times, but I just, it, it didn't work out like the logistics. So, but I do C4 on our regular basis now because I remember Mark, he used to use me like on a sporadic usage all the time. He'd be like, oh, well, you know, if somebody was, wasn't was able to make it, he'd be like, hey, can you make it, blah, blah, blah. But now he's like, I want to use you on a regular basis now. So like that's – and I'm happy with just working in C4 because it's a far drive. It's, it's a, it's a tough one. Drive. It's a nine-hour dri- nine drive, and we do it one way up real quick, wrestle, go right back home. It's just like you get maybe like two hours of sleep which I don't like. What are some of your better matches at C4 that people should check out? Um, I had a really fun match. I worked with Viking, the deathmatch guy, Viking. And like, I think we played like one or two spots and the rest was just, we just had so much fun with just bullshit. I, I love that match a lot. Um, I did a match. It was me, Julian and Anthony Green. That was my debut at C4. I really enjoyed that match. A lot of fun, which working with Julian honestly gave me a better boost of confidence because when I was, when we were going over the match structure, he's like, well, what do you do? I was like, I don't do a lot. I was like, you know, I, I was really hesitant because like I've wrestled people that were like names to me and you would throw out ideas and they would just shit on everything. Like, no, you're not doing that. You're not doing that. So I was like hesitant. And then Julian's just like, blah, blah, blah. And then we, Julian got stuff out of me. He's like, Tony, you just need to be more confident. He's like, just, he's like, be more confident when you're playing your match. So like, it helped me a lot. I really liked, like, I, and so like, I could never have anything against Julian because he's always been great to me. When you say Julian, Ethan Page? Yeah, yeah. Cool. Uh, all right, help me out with this timeline then. Working for Chikara, working for CZW, working for GCW. Which happens first in what order, and does that have an effect on uh, getting a foot in the door with the other spots? I started out at GCW, actually. Um, and Brett's – there's never been a time where Brett's like, no, you can't do either or. He's like, if you want to, I don't care. He's like, I'm not going to tell you no from a payday. But – uh. I did CZ, I did GCW at first and I was supposed to be in their first ever acid cup at the arena. And I remember when I started wrestling, <sighs> excuse me, Brett goes, Hey Tony, if somebody's going to offer you more money, all we, you know, you know, it's a business. Good. Don't, don't hesitate to take it. So a local company hit me up the day, like the day Brett, not the day of the acid cup, but when Brett gave me the date for the acid cup, they're like, Hey Tony, we want to have you here. And they paid me way more money. And it was literally five minutes from my house, which I never get. So I was like, hey, Brett, I'm not going to be able to do it. So like, And I already did one GCW show at the time. And then after that, Brett kicked me out of CZ, our GCW pretty much. <laughs> he, <laughs> he wasn't too happy about that. I go, I go, well, Brett, I'm doing what you told me to do. And he's just like, well, that's not what I meant. So that got me – not not essentially blackballed, but just – they, which I understand. It's just if you're not prioritizing them, they're not going to prioritize you. Yeah, exactly. So I was like, whatever. Um, and then I went to CZW, and I did – a there for like six months maybe and then you know sammy took over and i i i don't i say what i want to say not I don't, i'm not an asshole about it but like if i feel like something's bull crap about things i'm gonna just say it and i wasn't too thrilled that you know a lot of the uh ccw roster was turning to all of sammy's friends at the time and i was just like this is bullshit and i overheard a fan say oh, CZW is going to turn to Callahan's own wrestling. And I thought it was the most hilarious thing. So I said it to somebody else. Somebody got it back to Sammy. and Sammy wasn't too thrilled. That led to me no longer being booked at CZW, which honestly probably may have – honestly, if I didn't get kicked out of CZW, I probably would still be at CZW and not where I'm at right now. Sure. Because the second after that happened, like Brett found out, or I was, I was talking with Brett around the time about it, and then Brett goes, why won't you back at GCW? I was like, okay, cool. So then I went to GCW and that's where I got like the fire that I have now, like with the aggression and like the facials and stuff like that. Because uh, I remember I was the first match that I came back with them. I was me, Smiley, Eli Everfly and uh, Shinron, I think. Oh, <laughs> but hey, I'm surprised you survived that one. Oh um, my, don't even, don't even get me started on that. Worst experience <laughs> of my life. Worst experience of my life. I'll tell you what, if you survive that though, that's definitely reason enough to, uh, to keep bringing you back at that point. Yeah. So, uh, 
the ref screwed up on something. And I was like, I was really pissed off about of it. Of all the people to screw up on that match, it was the ref. <laughs> yeah. so, like, and he screwed up on the finish, and I and I was going over, and the, and I just came back for the first time in GCW for a long time. So they put the and they put the belt on me, which I was like, oh, like the that old uh, hardcore extreme title that was like with the big skull and stuff. Sure. I was like, oh, that's cool. Like, put a belt on him, and the guy screwed up the finish. So I was, I was fired up, and I was walking through the back, just still pissed off about everything. And there's somebody following me the camera, like, Tony, give me a promo. And I turned around and just like, I went wide eyed. And I was like, you want a fucking promo? And I just started going nuts on the cameraman. Camera turns off. Janelle looks at me. He's like, Tony, do that all the time. I was just like, oh, okay. So like that just escalated me to that more. And then in 2000, what year are we in? 2017, Shakara is running National Pro Wrestling Day. And Mike, Mike randomly started following me on Twitter. I was like, oh, I was like, that's weird. He's like, he's like, cool. I'm like, I'm not training at Shakara to get into the Wrestle Factory, or I'm not training at Wrestle Factory to get into Shakara. Like, I'm like, and I think Mike was just doing it just to check me out, make sure I wasn't like a total shithead. Because uh, he told the Whisper he could wrestle anybody he wanted to. And the Whisper is like, oh, I want to wrestle Tony. So I did that. I did that show. And then Mike messaged me. He's like, hey, Tony, I have an idea. Or, are you interested in these dates? I was like, yeah, sure. I'm like, I would love to do it. Cause that's a good learning experience for me. So I did that till recently uh, in September was my last show with them. Was the plan always for you to be a part of fist? I think that's was Mike's idea because a lot of people like my personality, especially like if I'm, if I'm more uh, family friendly personality, it's like almost like a Chuck Taylor. Sure. So like, that's why I think Mike wanted that because he wanted somebody who was like, the technical person like Akuma and that was Travis, me, the, the, the funny guy, but can wrestle when he needs to Chuck Taylor, me, you know, what's the whisper story. Cause I'm not going to do one of these with him, but he did backyard wrestling. Was he a Pennsylvania area guy? Yeah. He's, I think he's from the Allentown Philly area. Okay. And then he, he actually started training with Chikara. Yes. He and so because Chikara. you had enough problems as a professional at that point, if he went to bat for you, that was cool with Mike. Yeah, because I think Mike really liked him as a student. I think that's why Mike took his word a lot. So, because he was the Young Lions champion at the time. So, gotcha. And the only other uh, intersection that I can think of that we haven't touched on, although backtracking a little bit, um, and I really don't have much of a recollection of this day, was Beyond did a tryout at Chikara. You remember this? What? I, I, oh, tell me, tell me all about it. What? Oh what, what, what wild? What wild hair did I have across my ass that day? I hated. The, the seminar was fucking great. Quack let it, it, right? Yeah, it was a yeah. bike seminar. And it was me and me, my brother, and his tag partner versus the Minutemen and some other guy. So, like, they're planning this. Because uh, I think Mike gave us, like, seven minutes or something like that. I can't remember. Not much for time. And, like, they're planning out this, like, bam, 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 duh, 8,000 dives, blah, blah, blah. And we, we get it over plan with, and I walk up to my brother and I was just like, yo, Mike's going to shit all over this match. I was like, this sucks so bad. So we do the match, whatever. And they go to do one of their tag moves and my brother trips on, cause like the way that they're doing something, my brother tripped over his own feet or something like that. And they just decide to start stiffing my brother for no reason, like beating his ass. And my brother kept his cool. Didn't do anything. We finished the match. The match sucked, blah, blah, blah. I was pissed off because you know, I was like, oh, this could have been my shot of getting into beyond. And I had a stinker. I, and I remember apologizing to you a thousand times. And the match, is, match ends and uh, Mike's like, I want to talk to all of you guys in the back. And like, Mike just proceeds to rip everyone an asshole. He's like, you're all a bunch of fucking assholes. He's like, don't you ever fucking do that again. And he's screaming at these guys. And he looks at me, he's like, and Tony, like, like shock because like Mike's one of my favorite wrestlers ever. So I was like, my, dude, this guy's gonna ring party. He goes, Tony, you're an asshole, but you're a good asshole. So he's complimenting my character. So I, I didn't get yelled at too much. Like I, I still took the brunt of it because like I think wrestling's a tango. You know, everybody, one person fucks up, it's everybody. So like we get we all get yelled at, and I'm just pissed, like just like upset about it. And Gulak comes up, he's like, Tony, you, you did fine, don't worry, blah, blah, blah. And then the Minutemen come up to me and there's like oh, don't worry about it, man. It was your brother's fault. I go, excuse me? I was like, you guys, you guys set the pace of the entire match by being unnecessarily stiff for him for no reason on a, uh, on a trial match. I was like, and if this was, if it happened to me now, what I would have done is I would have tagged myself and came in, 
grabbed one of the guys, did something, tell him to roll me up and end it. I would have ended the match real quick because like it just progressively got worse. And everybody, and, like you could tell everybody was watching the match like, okay, this is, this is too much. You know, that's a, that's a tough call because sometimes when it's not clicking, you know, at what point do you say, well, why should we risk any further possible injury by trying to have this play out? We've already lost them. Um, not that I would ever recommend that to any of the wrestlers if, if they're not able to get it back on track, especially when we're doing live streams because it's, it's formatted uh, to the minute a lot of ways. But, yeah, I, I don't know. I think that would have been respectable. And, you know, who's to say, especially in an environment like that, uh, with the studio tapings and not having um, any fans in attendance, that there wouldn't be an opportunity for, for a possible ratio. I think that we did that once in Beyond Wrestling history, as best as I can remember, with, uh, with Danny Danger and uh, Matt. Matt uh, DeMorris, uh, De- 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 yeah, uh, Evan DeMorris now, uh, or EM, right? Uh, Evan Matthew DeMorris. Um, but they did a Spanish fly off the apron, and they weren't able to get back up from it, and they took their time, and they were going back to That's interesting. I wonder, I wonder how that would have played out if it would have been like, oh, you had your chance, you blew it, fuck you, or if it would have been like, oh, no, cool, like, get it together, let's do it again. Uh, th- those – the, the ones that we did specifically at Chikar, though, by having the component of having, like, Mike doing the seminar, we always felt very, very crunched on time, especially compared to how the studio tapings used to be because the tapings were just like, hey, we're here all day. Like, let's do a match. We'll bullshit for 40 minutes. You know, who needs to go get a uh, an Arizona iced tea at the store? Um, you know, and however those days would play out because it was just as much about hanging out as it was uh, creating. Um just because Chase Burnett, longtime Beyond Wrestling wrestler, asked, uh, and I just saw on Twitter, when's the last time you wrestled your brother? Um, shit. Oh, probably 2015, maybe. Is maybe. he still active? Not as much. He doesn't, like you know, like three times a month. Cause he has three kids, you know, worry about that stuff. So like me, I'm, I, I don't have any kids and stuff like that. So like, I, I have more free time. So he, he, as long as like, I look as way, it, I don't care how many, some, how many times somebody does wrestles a month, as long as they're safe on everything. Sure. Who am I to judge? Sure. So we talked about CCW Chikara talking about GCW, GCW, obviously uh, you came to prominence. GCW came to prominence. Let's go into the GCW run. What do you want to talk about from it? What would you like to know about that? Because there's a lot of things about it. I remember kind of the big eye-opening, maybe milestone moment would have been the match with uh, with Jungle Boy, um, which is kind of like maybe the final step that solidified you almost in that gatekeeper role. But there obviously had to have been plenty and plenty of matches leading up to that. So the floor is yours. I would honestly say that was the first time anybody's uh, put me in the eyes of uh, – um, the gatekeeper with GCW because prior to that I was doing a lot of multi-mans. I never, I rarely got a singles. Like I got a, I think I had like a singles here and there with like one with Kyle, one with Gacy and the rest were just uh, multi-mans no matter what. And like, and I was, I remember when they're like, Oh, well, Tony, you're gonna, you're actually a singles match in LA. I was like, Oh man, this is cool. Cause it's my first time ever being in California and I was getting a singles match. And I'll be honest. I, I despise that match. I don't think it's good at all. It's essentially a highlight video for uh, Jungle Boy, which that's what all Brett and them wanted. And it's like, so it's whatever. And I like, and I love Jack to death. And his dad was super cool with me about everything like that. And I remember him telling uh, me his like after his father passed away, he's like, "Oh, my dad just my dad wanted me and you to do uh, uh, stunts together in a movie if you ever get a chance to." He's like, "Cause you guys," he said that we'd have really good chemistry. He's like. He's like, would that something you'd ever be interested if it came about? I was like, yeah, love that. Because it'd be such a cool thing to do stunts. So, like, but after that, a lot of, some people started to notice, like, oh, wow, Tony, he's pretty, he's, he's decent in the ring. And he, like, and he's got a personality. Because I'm not a gift wrestler. I'll never be, like, Zane or any of them guys. Like, I can't do that stuff. Like, so, like, I, I never get over on gifts. It's like, you have to see me live to experience the way I wrestle. Because like, I'm, I'm a personality and stuff like that. And I can do some form of moves, I guess. So I do that, and then I – we didn't do much. Like, I think we did maybe one show after that because it was, November was when we went to L.A. or L.A. And, like, and we weren't running three, four shows a month like we are now. We were doing once a month. And then I went to, and to L.A. again in March and wrestled Jake Atlas. And that 
really got the the ball rolling. Like, okay, if you're going to have a good wrestler, uh, or you're going to have a guy come into GCW, a new guy, he's going to wrestle Tony. And then in February, I wrestled Chris for the first time. That was when Chris really didn't come into GCW before that. So no, I think I think just before that, maybe he had the match with uh, with Gage, the hardcore match. That was after. That was after that. that okay. Was in, that was in May, and me and Chris was February. <laughs> Stop it! Stop it! You know, you know, Tony. Somebody's asking me why. Why do you have a hairless cat? I, I hope that's not the hairless cat making that noise in the background. Uh, <laughs> knock it off. You gotta be careful, man. Peter's gonna be calling us about that and the lobster. I just pushed her off the window so because she's barking at stuff. Get down. Uh, well, my wife is obsessed with Sphinx cat. She's always wanted one. Okay. And because like we we can't have real cats because she's allergic to cats. So, okay. And Achilles and Bailey, stop it. So <laughs> we um take him outside. So. We saw somebody back home where we're in Shemokin. We because I don't live in Shemokin anymore. Mm-hmm. She saw somebody was getting rid of uh, a Sphinx cat for free because she had multiple ones of them, and they were harassing the the males were harassing the female. So they're like, "Anybody want a Sphinx cat for free?" And my wife was like, "Yes." So we took my dogs in to make sure that they're they're not going to eat cats, which I knew they weren't going to. And I came home from. A long weekend. I was like, I was gone Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and I came home to a hairless cat. <laughs> I didn't pay a dollar for it, which is great. We adopted it because those cats are about two thousand dollars. Yeah. Oh, well, that, that all's well that ends well. Yes. Uh, again, hopping back to GCW, kind of being in that gatekeeper role. Is that something that you take pride in? Is that the type of thing where maybe at first it's kind of a hard sell because that kind of slots you at a certain spot in the card where it's like it's it must be. I mean, just me talking out not as a wrestler. I'd be excited for that because it means that I'm going to be used with some regularity. I might be a little bit disappointed because it might prevent my ability to move up the card when it's expected, oh, this is the person that's going to wrestle the new guy every show. It does come with that because like, I've always thought that it's like it, it limits my growth on certain things. But like, I'm not going to complain about it because it's a, it, it's a monthly sp- or a, by, like I, three times a month spot. Like, about every show like so i'm not gonna complain about that like and then every so often brett brett gives me like a guy that i can learn from like i I wrestled gresham i wrestled uh tracy williams star i was supposed to wrestle alex shelley and i got to pick that match because brett's like hey tony whoever you want let me know i've got you so i wanted alex shelley and that's what i got well i was supposed to get him but not not happening right now that's definitely the truth. <laughs> but uh, the match with David Starr was another one, too, where a lot of people kind of regarded that as, as their favorite match in all of independent wrestling uh, for last year, which has to be pretty high accolades. Yeah, uh, I was nervous going because that was a Monday, and that weekend we – yeah, uh, Uncharted Territory, did that start at the time? Because that was the end of September. Uncharted started on October 3rd for so season three. a couple days before. Yeah, because it was that it was the Monday before Uncharted started. So before that, I did Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and I was on the West Coast the entire time. And I got home like early Monday morning, didn't sleep because like me and Orange Cassidy were on a show, and Jerry was there too, and the one uh, two of the shows. Oh, uh, would have been probably uh, the show for B Boy, and then the show for Prestige. Yeah, correct. Those cool. shows. <clears throat> so like we all got maybe like for those two, three days, maybe like six hours of sleep. If that my wife picked me up, we went back to her aunt's house and we stayed, I slept for like three hours. But when I was at ground zero, I screwed up my meniscus really bad. Like I couldn't walk for like, Jim was like, Tony, what's wrong? Cause I was walking stiff leg for two days straight and I just couldn't bend my knee. I could barely run. Like I remember I had to get my match from prestige switched because it was supposed to be Puma King and myself in a match. And I, and I went up to Will. I was like, I can't run. I can't run. It's like, I, I physically can't run. I was like, and he's going to do Lucha and I can't base. Mm-hmm. I like, so, and I'm like, and I don't want to give you guys a bad match. It's like, cause this is your debut on IWTV. So like I'm going into the star match. And I was like, I was like, David, I was like, uh, it's like my, like, I, I can't do anything. It's like, I, I don't. And Brett's like, I remember I said to Brett and Brett's like, well, you got to pull something out of it, Tony. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. So I said to star, I was like, yeah, I was like my, like, I can't run. I, I, I can barely bend my knee and he's just like, well, well, let's, 
let's take we'll take care yeah. of you tonight. I was like, okay, cool, whatever. You know. So like we're uh and I like when he was like because like we did a lot of like uh we had a slower pace like submissions. I was like, can you just avoid my left knee, please? I was like, because it's mm-hmm. gonna hurt so bad. And I just remember like it, I don't know how I got through that match, but I did. And like I remember I do that little backwards drop over the top rope and I jumped up, hit it perfectly on star. And like, I just got this wave of emotion. I'm just like, okay, I fucking got this. Like I've got this. Like I was so fired up. All the adrenaline was boom match ends instantly. I feel pain in my knee. And then I rested for two days and I came up into beyond. And then I did Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, a place. And then I just kept doing that all the month of October on a bruised meniscus. And I just, my knee is finally feeling better. So this is like a blessing in disguise that this is happening because I can finally get some legit mobility back to my knee. Cause it was, I just started being to work out my legs like a month and a half ago and I'm still scared of doing it. Cause like my knee hurts all the time. Sure. Uh, probably a good time to jump into beyond. You've done a few matches uh, when we were doing crossover stuff with Jakara as part of fist. And then like you said, um, you got the match with AR Fox uh, when it was originally supposed to be you versus Joey Janela. Um, at the inaugural Please Come Back event. But, of course, Joey going down <clears throat> with an injury, but really getting a permanent spot on the Beyond Wrestling roster was actually an idea that Jerry had uh, going all the way back to season one, um, which was the idea of somebody that maybe is bigger than the Discovery Gauntlet using the loophole of it's the only match you're guaranteed if you win, you come back next week, um, and kind of jumping in and holding it hostage um, and that's, you know, one of the bigger surprises that we had on the first episode of season two of Uncharted Territory, um, leading to matches with Daniel Garcia, Manders, um, AJ Gray, Bishop, and then uh, losing to Matt Mikowski. Um, I will just say this, when Jerry kind of pitched the idea, a lot of times, now that it works, it's not that there's like a full creative team, but part of the process is like, you know, if, if I have final say on everything that's going to happen in terms of what we're putting together for Beyond Wrestling, I certainly always welcome input from everybody, um, but it has to go through my filter because it has to fit in uh, with the context of everything else that we're going to be presenting. And I just remember having that conversation over the summer where, you know, you decided to make that leap of, of leaving a full-time job to pursue wrestling um, 100%, which is an unbelievable risk for anybody to take. Um, and I liked it. You know, I thought that there was something cool about it. And, and for what we had set up for Uncharted Territory, you know, uh, I thought it was cool to be able to, to get you in consecutively. When, you know, even wrestlers like Chris Dickinson, Josh Briggs, and Anthony Green, even though they're there a lot, they're not on every single card. Um, what would you think of the idea for the Discovery Gauntlet? I loved it. And it helped me a lot. like, because you'll be the first one to really attest this. Like, I'm, I, my, I think my weak point is promos. Cause like you would even talk to me about it, stuff like that. So like, it helped me at least get in the, the habit of cutting promos more. Mm-hmm. Cause like n- G stuff, you're never asking that stuff. They just be like, Hey, go on and wrestle. Sure. Or like, or like when, you, or, or when, you, when you did your promo, it was just not in the same context of, you know, it was just a backstage promo. And like when Joey said, do more of that, but it's different when you're given specific guidelines to push a story in a certain direction. Yeah. Which like, like, cause you even, like you said to me before you said something, I was like, well, I appreciate that it even went that way because I got to, you know, try that. Cause I've, I, I've never had the opportunity to do it. And I really enjoyed it. And I, I remember being there. Cause you're like, you can't be seen, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, nobody's gonna really care that I'm here. Like Mikowski's music went on, nobody cared. And then all of a sudden my music hit. And then like, I heard all these people flip it. I was like, wow. I was like, people actually you know care. And then, but over the time, like more people, like it sucked because I was supposed to play the heel, but over time it just kept, people just kept enjoying what was going on so much. I don't even know if they enjoyed me per se, but they enjoyed the fact that I wasn't supposed to be there, but I was always still there just constantly getting by on something. No, I mean, come on, dude, you got to give yourself credit. You had, you had some show stealing performances too, especially the match with Daniel Garcia, I think was something that nobody was expecting. It blew a lot of people away. Um, the match with Manders, I feel like that was one of the first times that he got to have that type of match on that stage to show, you know, he's not just the guy that comes and helps out. Um, you know, there's actually something to it. Uh, and then the match with AJ Gray as well, uh, short, short and explosive. Um, so, you know, there were some show stealing performances in there. It's funny, by virtue of being tied to the Discovery Gauntlet, you almost take over the gatekeeper role and be on wrestling as well. Uh, but as we move later into the season, singles matches with Dickinson, Briggs, 
Um, and then another show stealing performance with uh, Carlos Romo. Um, he specifically asked to wrestle you. D- had you ever had any prior correspondence with him? No, maybe like a high on Twitter or something like that or yeah. whatever like that. But like I remember that like the traffic was the worst ever. So him and I planned the entire match out over the phone going there. And we were the first, we were, the, we were supposed to be the, uh, we weren't supposed to be on the main show, if memory serves me correct. We were supposed to be the. It was going to uh, be the spotlight match. Yeah, exactly. So, I, like, I said to Jerry, I was like, well, what, try to get Drew to switch it. And then you kept, you specifically said, well, tell him to call him on the phone. Like, you didn't even say, well, maybe I'll switch it. You're just like, tell him to call on the phone. Dude, like, we, have to, we have to start on time unless the equipment to stream ain't there. And you were with Jerry. So, luckily, you got a, got a nice little pass that day. And thankfully, oh, like, Thankfully, Davian and Ava Everett were ready to step up the match that they pulled out of their ass on about 15 minutes notice to, to well, buy us a little time, too. When I got there, I was on the impression that it was still a spotlight match. Yeah. And then I got there, like, oh, Tony, you're first. I was like, oh, thank God. Like, because I had to take a dump before I got there. I was like, <laughs> I, I would have crapped my pants. And then the worst thing, ever, I forgot my, my trunks. That's right. Like, so, like. Somebody's like, well, why don't you just wear your under trunks? And I, I sat, like, Dickens, like, wear your under trunks. So I wore, I, I put them on and I pulled up my leg and my balls started hanging out. He goes, yeah, don't wear them. It's like, exactly. That's why I can't wear them. Well, like, and that's all the tickets and wrestles on it is his under trunks. Yeah. So. <laughs> so, thankfully, Wheeler, you was like, hey, I have an extra pair of black trunks, Tony. I was like, oh, you do, man. That guy's, a cl- that guy's a clutch locker room guy. I know he's chomping at the bit to get on uh, positive contact. Uh, we'll fast forward a little bit. And then headlining your first Beyond Wrestling event, Beyond Championship Wrestling, singles match with John Silver. And uh, just to kind of give a little context and insight to that show, obviously the whole show was kind of a, uh, ooh, a satire, I think is the word that we want to use on television style wrestling. Cause it's very difficult to put on an authentic beyond wrestling show in the Melrose building because they will not allow fans to go ringside. They insist on having chairs and guardrails, even though WWE didn't bring the guardrails that day. I don't know how um, that stuck by the lady that she let us on the show, but not trying to bring more attention to that. Um, but, your function on the show was after this pilot fails uh, and we go back to authentic beyond wrestling is now here come you and John Silver as a surprise to give these people uh, a big satisfying main event. Um, did you feel added pressure or? Yeah, because I wasn't sure how they're going to respond to it because everything was hokey the entire match. So I was like, well, are they going to, are they going to care that we're doing like getting murdered in the face? You know, like, I wasn't sure how the fan because they were responding with the wacky stuff. Like I felt they were popping pretty good for all that stuff. So I was like, I really hope that this, this can transition into them doing this for a real match. And I, but I feel like what helped it a lot is when you came out at the end, you're like, Oh, we're going to give you a beyond match. And you had all the guys come out. And I think that really added to it. If you wouldn't have done that, I don't feel like John and I would have got the reception we got with the match. So that's my personal opinion, just because the fans were like, okay, that was a lot of fun. And then they go like, oh, we get this now? Sure. I mean, the two ideas are always kind of tied, no matter what. Is this, The show was, hey, let's make the best of the limitations that we have. Let's hit them with some really big announcements, and let's make sure that we send them home happy. Because for the last few times that I've gone to WWE events, whatever the advertised bonus main event is, like one time I saw, I want to say it was Asuka and Kyrie Sane against um, the Iconics, and it was a non-televised match that went two minutes and ended in disqualification. And it was like, Oh, this is your idea of sending home people happy, sending people home happy. Like, why even bother with it? Um, and and that's happened a couple other times. So, um, you know, I, I'm always thinking of uh, how to put the screws to WWE. No, <laughs> that's not true. But no, I, you know, I watch and observe, and I do try and figure out you know, what are different things that we can do on an independent level to differentiate ourselves. What are some of the shortcomings of of, of the bigger um, organizations where we can kind of pick up the slack? Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's really a shame that everything that was scheduled uh, with the collective, obviously, even if it's postponed, it, it's never going to be able to happen in the same iteration as it was scheduled to do so. How many matches did you have scheduled? I had 10. And how many of those were part of the collective? And did you have any others outside of that? One. I had a no ring show with no peace underground. They had- okay. They were running with the collective, but then Wednesday they had their own that wasn't part of the collective. Gotcha. And it was supposed to be like Wednesday, at like six, and I land like I was supposed to land at like four and then go straight there and wrestle. But you know, what happened? Gotcha. Well, I think now is a good time to reiterate to the people that have uh, been watching, uh, and, and thank you so much for taking the time to do this positive contact interview. 
again, what's the best way that people can support you right now? Because, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to reveal your booking fee, but 10 matches is, is, is a month at the very least a month's worth of work um, all taken away in one fell swoop, not even factoring in the merchandising opportunities. And then of course too, like there's parts of it where it's like, yeah, you do all these matches, you reward yourself a little, you're almost on vacation for the tail end of it. Yeah. Like, um, yeah. So yeah, what what can what can people do to, to help put a couple extra bucks in your pocket? My uh, pro wrestling t uh, website's under Tony Deppin. So uh, how many how many shirt designs you got up there? Who does the shirts? I want to say I have six t-shirts. Okay, six or seven, I believe. How, how does how does a wrestler go about getting a design? Like you just people, does anybody ever say, "Hey, I I was inspired. This is this cool thing. I want you to have it." A fan did that for me, and what I did is like I made t-shirts and a, a pin out of it and i was like hey for you doing that like because she just sent it to me like she didn't have to i was like here, i sent her a pin and a t-shirt for free i was like don't even bother i was like it's your artwork you know you see it well you, you get to see it on on paper pretty much and then i had another fan he he took a picture of me which i used the picture as a silhouette for myself mm -hmm. and i was like hey, he's like oh my god i can't believe one of my shirt or one of my pictures are being used as a shirt i was like oh well i'll give you the shirt for free because that's your picture Cause I always like, I always ask permission when I do photo, like if I sure. use and everything. So like stuff like that. My pro wrestling tea is like fan, like, or you purchase an artist to do some stuff for you, which I do that as well. And then my one friend, uh, we're really close friends. So he always hooks me up with designs for free. Just, and I just give him a free t-shirt. So, and then you could order these straight through me. They're uh, a pit, a sticker of my cat and myself. She's putting me in a choke hold. You can order them specifically through me, which I also have uh, beer koozies as well. So you can order, like, you have to just message me on Twitter. I, they're five, the stickers are five dollars, the koozies are five dollars. And normally, if you order both, I, I don't make, I don't charge you for shipping because it's not going to cost me too much money because it's complete, it's too thin to charge me. It'll charge you like, it'll be like a dollar for shipping, stuff like that. So, and then if you want to message me, message me on Twitter or Instagram, which my Twitter is Tony underscore Deppin. And then my Instagram is Insta Deppin. So Insta, not Insta, like it's just like I-N-S-T-A, just like an Instagram. So other than that, like I don't, like I've said, I said earlier, don't bother adding me on Facebook. I have about 600 friends sitting in my inbox and I refuse to add them, nothing against them. But I, one, I don't post a lot on my Facebook and two, I use it for more of like a personal thing, like for family and such, so. Well, one of the ideas that I've been uh, kicking around, which we're going to use Dickinson as the guinea pig for, um, is the independent wrestler stimulus package. Because uh, I really think that especially doing positive contact um, and then, you know, trying to launch this series as well, there's got to be ways that we can continue to be creative and be productive. And also, you know, if people have more time on their hands. Now's a good time to get caught up on the stuff that you've missed. Cause even, even like IWTV streaming, like some of the old Beyond Wrestling studio tapings right now, people are like, I mean, I haven't gone back and watched them. So I don't know how it's going to hold up. But people go back and are like, Oh my God, this is so innovative. This is so creative. Um, so it's good to see that stuff like that can, can get a second life and be repurposed. Um, but let's try and uh, connect uh, outside of this and see what we can put together because I'd love uh, to be able to do, an independent wrestler stimulus package stream on our YouTube channel uh, with some of your best matches, maybe not only from beyond wrestling, but also from some of the IWTV partners. And that's going to have a built in fundraising component through the super chat feature, where if you're in the chat, you can answer questions about the matches as people are watching them. And then any of the donations that are raised, um, I do have to see, that's why I'm using tickets as the, as the experiment. I don't know how long it takes for the money to clear. Cause like I know with the, like with the acid cup, it took like, a couple of weeks in order for, for the money to be able to process. So I don't know what that is, but I know that we can track it. So a hundred percent of the proceeds from that um, can go to the wrestlers. And I really want to make sure that we're focusing on taking care of the wrestlers um, that had the most collective bookings. Cause you, you guys are feeling it the most right now. Um, which is also why I wanted to make sure that you can come in here and kind of tell your, tell your story too. Cause I think it takes a lot of guts to be able to step away from um, job security to pursue your dreams. And, that's something that I know like a lot of my friends growing up that have kind of what probably would consider people would consider to be more normal lives. Whenever I see them and we catch up, they always say how much they admire. And I do think it's a very admirable trait to, to live your life on your own terms. And it, it takes a lot of guts and obviously a lot of risk involved. And with, with the current climate, all everything that's going on, um, 
it sucks. So I want to make sure that we can do everything we can do to support you, Tony. I appreciate you taking the time to do positive contact. Do you have any wise words to sign us off with? Uh, I'm not a wise person. Not so a I'm, wise person. Well, how about this? The, the only other story that I can think of is uh, when we were down in uh, Orlando for um, WrestleMania. Uh, me, you, and Nicholas K took a trip out to go to Cigar City Brewing. Tampa. To visit it was in Tampa. Tampa. It was the Saint. Yes. Yeah, I literally just came up with my time hop. Like, yeah, it just it, it came up. That. Yeah. So, What's what's your favorite beer? We'll so we'll, we'll end it with that. Oh my god, that's really hard because I've had thousands of beers. Is it Heady Topper? <laughs> no, I don't like that too much. <laughs> it's it, if I'm going to pick any, it was my go-to is Yingling Lager. Yingling Lager, you can't, you just can't beat it. No, you can't. It's it's, it's but especially like I grew up in that area because that's where Yingling's from. Like, sure. So you can't beat it. I, well, I how about this then? Every, I mean, Yingling's distributed around the United States. It's a, it's a solid beer. What's the strangest beer you ever had? I had a beer that had like legit peanuts, like they, uh, like it, I can't talking to a, uh, like a person who doesn't know too much about the brewing process. Cause like I brew, so I understand it. Okay. But like they put a uh, beer in the fermentation stage. So like, there's like, sh- like peanut like coatings in the beer still. It was supposed to be like a natural peanut butter beer. It was awesome. But it was just really weird. Like the texture, like, and I've already had beers that had a texture of jelly before. Like it's really weird. Like it tasted great, but it's just the I don't know what they're doing, but the texture is so off putting but so good. <laughs> so it tasted good, but it had like a peanut buttery texture? Yeah, like, like almost like that oily Yeah, like like and then I've had like ones like a peanut butter and jelly beer and sure. like, you could legit like feel like it felt like you were drinking jelly, like a thick, almost clumpy esque beer is it was weird but great. Well, you know what, Tony? Thank you for your time. I think I'm going to stick to the Yinglings, all right? Sounds good to me. Thank you. All right, man. You take care.